Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Monday, November 23rd, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Mars may still be volcanically active, which could mean positive things for the potential of life on the planet. More good vaccine news, this time from Oxford and AstraZeneca. And speaking of Oxford, the dictionary took a weird turn for their word of the year. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Could Mars have had volcanic activity much more recently than previously believed? That's what a team from the University of Arizona and the Smithsonian Institute propose in a new paper that's not yet peer-reviewed but has been submitted to the journal Icarus. While previous research indicated that the most recent volcanic eruption on Mars occurred two and a half million years ago, this new paper indicates that there may have been one just 53,000 years ago, recent enough that the possibility of occasional eruptions on Mars is not out of the question. Previously, the planet was thought to be more or less dead, with no activity happening even beneath the surface. The deposit being studied comes from the region of Cerberus Fasse and concerns the large volcano Elysium Mons. Quoting the New York Times, It's about 1,000 miles east of NASA's stationary InSight lander, which touched down on Mars in 2018 to study tectonic activity on the red planet. Appearing like a crack in the surface, the feature looks like a recent fissure eruption, where subsurface volcanic activity has caused superheated volcanic ash and dust to burst through the surface. It's similar to deposits caused by pyroclastic eruptions that scientists have spotted on the Moon, Mercury, and Earth. Originating from magma deep beneath the surface, the eruption would have reached a height of several miles before falling back to the ground. The amount of material is estimated at 100 times less than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, said Stephen Anderson, an Earth Sciences professor at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, who was not involved in the paper. It's the presence of darker material here, coupled with its symmetrical appearance around the fissure, that hints at an eruption. Known as a fault scarp, this type of feature is very common in Hawaii, as magma near volcanoes causes the surface to expand and crack, says Robert Craddock from the Smithsonian Institute, a co-author on the paper. End quote. The team have dated the eruption as between 53,000 to 210,000 years old, which is a bit of a gap, but still significantly less than two and a half million years ago. It's recent enough that scientists believe if it's true, it could mean Mars is still volcanically active. And the Mars quakes that have been recorded by NASA's InSight lander could add to this theory. While its seismometer has measured hundreds of these vibrations, only two of them have been localized, and both came from Cerberus Fasse, the same region this deposit was found in. Suzanne Smrekar from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Deputy Principal Investigator on the InSight mission said, quote, It's certainly plausible that the tectonic activity is related to volcanic activity, end quote. And if there is volcanic activity, there could be life. It could melt subsurface ice, providing a habitat for living things. And Dr. Anderson notes, quote, To have life, you need energy, carbon, water, and nutrients. And a volcanic system provides all of those, end quote. Some scientists, however, are skeptical about the dating method employed by this team, and again, the paper is yet to be peer-reviewed and formally published, but David Horvath, the lead author, says that even if they're way off, even if the eruption was a million years ago, that would still change our present conception of Mars. The good vaccine news just keeps on coming. On the backs of really promising news from the Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, now Oxford AstraZeneca have announced the preliminary results from their Phase 3 trials, which showed overall 70% efficacy. As a reminder, Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccines both currently show around 95% efficacy, but 70% is still very solid. That's about where Dr. Fauci had been saying he'd be very pleased to see. But I say overall 70% because there's a weird quirk of the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine that I, as someone who is not an immunologist, don't quite understand, but hopefully we'll get more information on it in the coming days. Here's what I can tell you for now. The vaccine, like the Pfizer-BioNTech one, would need to be distributed in two doses. However, the first dose just needs to be half a dose. 
For some reason, doing a half dose on the first injection makes the whole vaccine overall more effective than if you got two whole doses. Quoting Stat News, The preliminary results on the AstraZeneca vaccine were based on a total of 131 COVID-19 cases in a study involving 11,363 participants. The findings were perplexing. Two full doses of the vaccine appeared to be only 62% effective at preventing disease, while a half dose followed by a full dose was about 90% effective. That latter analysis was conducted on a small subset of the study participants, only 2,741. A U.S.-based trial being supported by Operation Warp Speed is testing the two-full-dose regimen. That may soon change. AstraZeneca plans to explore adding the half-dose, full-dose regimen to its ongoing clinical trials in discussions with regulatory agencies, a spokesman told Stat in an email. End quote. And quoting from the New York Times, The Oxford scientists said they were still trying to understand why the vaccine was more effective at a smaller first dose. The first dose is supposed to prime the immune system, while the second is supposed to boost its response. While it seemed counterintuitive for a smaller first dose to be more effective, they said that strategy may more closely mimic what happens with a real infection. End quote. Peter Openshaw, professor of experimental medicine at Imperial College London, explained to the Associated Press that vaccines don't work like normal drugs where a higher dose produces more effects. The immune system is more complicated. Openshaw also notes that if indeed people do only need half a dose for one of the injections, that's great news because it will be even cheaper to produce for more people. This was the vaccine candidate that I was most excited about early on because it seemed like they kind of had a head start. Quoting the New York Times, AstraZeneca's vaccine is designed to genetically alter an adenovirus found in chimps so that it harmlessly mimics the coronavirus and provokes an immune response. A vaccine deploying that technology has never won approval, but the approach has been studied before, notably in a small 2018 study of an experimental vaccine against the virus that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. That virus is related to SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19. So when COVID-19 emerged, the team of scientists at Oxford's Jenner Institute that had been leading the work on similar coronaviruses had a head start. Once the genetic code of SARS-CoV-2 was published in early January, the Oxford team sped to adapt their platform to the new coronavirus and begin animal testing. End quote. The other win in Oxford AstraZeneca's corner is, unlike the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, this latest one does not require any special refrigeration. Just standard storage and transportation temperatures of 2 to 8 degrees Celsius, or 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit, and it can be stored for up to six months. The Moderna vaccine requires cooler temperatures of negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit, but then can be stored at normal refrigeration temperatures after thawing, and can be stored as such for a month. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, meanwhile, requires dry ice to store it at negative 70 degrees Celsius, or negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That makes the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine much more appealing for areas without the infrastructure or funding to sustain the Pfizer-BioNTech cold chain. And with that in mind, AstraZeneca is applying for early approval wherever it can, as well as an emergency use listing from the World Health Organization so that it can be made available in low-income countries. They plan to produce 3 billion doses next year and are committed to providing it at cost around the world through July 2021. The vaccine costs around 3 or 4 US dollars, significantly less than the others. Late stage trials are continuing in the US, Japan, Russia, South Africa, Kenya, and Latin America, and further trials are planned for other European and Asian countries. So, definitely more good news, but watch this space for more. Something I always feel like I should have a better grasp on but don't is cryptocurrency. It's a huge opportunity for investing, and actually, Bitcoin has been one of the best-performing assets of 2020. One way to get on the crypto train, or secure your path if you're already on it, is by adding crypto to your IRA. 
BitTrust IRA will help you seamlessly and securely add cryptocurrency to your portfolio. And when I say securely, I mean it. They literally store your private keys in 100% offline cold storage in decommissioned nuclear bunkers. Plus, they have an easy-to-use 24-7 trading platform with no minimum investments, unlimited trades, and a support team to help you out whenever you need it. To learn more, go to bittrustira.com slash kotki. And for a limited time, BitTrust IRA is waiving the sign-up fee for Kotki Ride Home listeners. That's a $50 value that you can save by going to bittrustira.com slash kotki. That's B-I-T-T-R-U-S-T-I-R-A dot com slash kotki. Bit Trust IRA.com slash Kotke. We've got a bit of a different kind of sponsor for this episode. It's The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you should really be listening to. And I know every day somebody tells you you just have to listen to this podcast or this podcast, and you say sure, but you never really listen. Don't let that happen this time. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so that you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening, even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different, fascinating guest, and when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. In one episode, Jordan talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like and trust you, which sounds both useful and disturbing. Another episode tells the story of a cinematographer who discovered a lost city in the jungle and made one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. I recommend that cocky Ride Home listeners check out Jordan's conversation with Celeste that has all kinds of insight on communicating with people in your life better. And you have to listen to Jordan's conversation with Billy McFarland, a.k.a. the dude behind Firefest. Yeah, for real. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful, practical insights out of his brilliant guests. And not like the pop psychology or half-big self-help kind of stuff, the episodes are loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. I really enjoy listening to the show, and I think you will as well, so search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Earlier this month, I shared Collins Dictionary's announcement of their 2020 word of the year, lockdown. They had a top 10 list so that they could give honorable mentions to other very 2020 words like coronavirus, social distancing, BLM, and TikToker. Well, now it's Oxford's turn to announce their 2020 word of the year, and instead of going Collins' route by picking one but having nine others to highlight, Oxford decided they straight up couldn't choose. Yeah, in lieu of picking one of the many new or newly popular words from the past year, the Oxford English Dictionary instead published a 16-page report analyzing the background and usage of dozens of words across multiple subject areas, including the pandemic, the environment, social movements, and remote work. LitHub points out that the Oxford English Dictionary has a pattern of bending their own definition of word of the year. The 2019 word of the year was climate emergency, which LitHub points out is clearly a two-word term. And in 2015, the word of the year was the crying while laughing emoji which LitHub calls, quote, the word of the year equivalent of giving Bob Dylan the Nobel Prize in literature, end quote. Casper Grathwall, the president of Oxford Dictionaries, said, quote, I've never witnessed a year in language like the one we've just had. The Oxford team was identifying hundreds of significant new words and usages as the year unfolded, dozens of which would have been a slam dunk for word of the year at any other time. It's both unprecedented and a little ironic, in a year that left us speechless, 2020 has been filled with new words unlike any other. End quote. Which is true, but even by their own monitoring, the word coronavirus outpaced the frequency of one of the most frequently used nouns in the English language, time. And yet, coronavirus alone apparently wasn't enough to define 2020. Quoting the BBC, It's inevitable that the pandemic should have rescued old words, coronavirus, supercharged some that were loitering in our culture, furlough, and in the case of COVID, created a neologism. 
What's more striking to me is how the news cycle generates new phrases and usages. Black Lives Matter, or BLM, was in usage before George Floyd was killed, but today it has penetrated our public domain as never before. So to mail-in and conspiracy theory, not because the conspiracy theories about mail-in ballots are new or true, but rather because they are espoused by the most famous person in the world, in Donald J. Trump. Yet the news cycle is a fickle friend, and sometimes not even a friend. That usage of Brexit should be down by 80% even as we enter its most critical phase shows that sadly, the limited bandwidth of news programs and human attention can harm priorities. End quote. As salty as I may sound about the fact that the OED couldn't bring themselves to pick just one word for their word of the year, I mean, it's better than the New York Times' double endorsement of Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar, but I do have to admit that the 16-page report is actually pretty interesting. A particular highlight for me is the word unmute. There's a graph included for usage of the word unmute that honestly you could kind of line up against coronavirus cases in a lot of locations. The graph spans from October 2019 to now, and you see a significant spike in usage in April of this year, falling over the summer and spiking back up again in August where it stays mostly steady until now. And I know that it mostly reflects remote work, but I like to imagine a situation where lots of people got really good at remembering to unmute themselves and then suddenly forgot again when it became fall. Also notable is that climate-related words have significantly decreased this year, although we do have a new word in anthropause. And I didn't know this, but the word staycation actually dates all the way back to 1944. So, yes, a fascinating report, which you can peruse more at the link in the show notes, but definitively not a word of the year. Your move, Webster. That is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird. And I'm going to get my bets in early for Oxford English Dictionary's 2021 word of the year being AstraZeneca, or else some combination of letters and numbers that's totally unpronounceable, you know, like Elon Musk's baby's name. In any case, I hope you all have a great start to your week, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.